Honorable Prof. Anis Bajrek Tevrik, PhD, from IMC University Applied Science Krem Austrian University, and also the former United Nations of Vienna, Austria, Diastama Anggita Ramadan, SHLLM, as a moderator today, students and all the participants. First of all, uh, good afternoon. First of all, let us uh, say Alhamdulillah to thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has been giving us guidance and prosperity so we can gather here. On behalf of Faculty of Law, Diponegoro University, I would like to say welcome to our special guest, Prof. Anis. Welcome to our beloved Faculty of Law, even in virtual. And uh, the theme of fixating lecture today is Sino-American Strategy, the coupling impact of Republic Indonesia and ASEAN. In this grateful, uh, gratingful occasion, I do hope with this fixating lecture would be give mutual beneficial and significant implication to our education, especially in development of student quality. I would like to express my gratitude and thanks to Prof. Anis. We do hope the collaboration and networking can be implemented continuously in the future. And for all participants, students, thank you for joining the visiting lecture today. Enjoy the visiting lecture and be an active student. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, Dr. Trilaksmi Indraswari, for the speech. Uh, without any further ado, uh, please, Professor Anis Bajrektarevich, to give uh, the lecture for the students. Time is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Once more, pity that we that we had this uh, let's say a misunderstanding, so that you that, that we are starting late with the lecture. Uh, but uh, okay, so we we're gonna fetch up uh, the time. Uh, so as we speak, they are they are counting of of the of the votes in the presidential elections of United States. But um, the point is that basically um, the system that exists in in United States does not necessarily depend on on who is occupying the position of president. And very often we are obsessed with, uh, uh, let's say, the chief executive in the country. And we are forgetting that the country, although the function of president or prime minister is important, um, this is not the only, uh, let's say, institution that exists. And that in many aspects, the policies and the directions of, of the countries are not directly dependent on who is occupying the office of the chief executive. Uh, so the same goes with the United States and most probably same goes with China um, as the two powers or those two countries that are seen as the, let's say some sort of superpowers after the demise of Soviet Union that was considered as a superpower so United States and Soviet Union for most of the time after the Second World War were considered as the superpowers. And now this has been replaced after a certain period, it has been replaced now with China. So at certain point, at, at this precise point of time, we have the uh, strategy or we have uh, actually an implications that are going in the direction of uh, strategic decoupling of the two. And of course, Indonesia and, and the rest of uh, uh, Southeastern Asia is at the very, uh, let's say, uh, a specific position. And it's uh, uh, basically uh, passing the, the fault lines between those two superpowers. So what both of them or each of them would require very soon is a sort of acclamation, whether you are for them or against them. And that puts every country into a very difficult position. 
So when there is a cooperation between the, the nations and the countries, then the smaller nations, the smaller powers are profiting. This is very prosperous times. But when the big powers are in disagreement, then usually oh, it always actually triggers a lot of tensions, a lot of trouble for the smaller ones. As the saying goes, the small countries are starting small wars and the big countries are starting big wars. You as a small country, although in history, you will see in history books that like small nations started this and that, and then it triggered a bigger conflict. So without actually, without the will and intention of the big power, there is no big war. The small powers or small countries are starting only small ones. So it's very simple. So what does it mean precisely? What is going on right now? And it has, a, of course, a legal and economic and social and political implications, even the health implications, is that United States, after the grand reapproachment towards China in the 70s, realized that the policy of engagement of China does not bring results, and even moreover, it does not bring any benefit to United States or to the Western countries. And that this policy has to be reconsidered, at least stopped, if not reversed. So many in the West are understanding that China is not only a strategic competitor, but that China is an enemy. And this is a major shift. Of course, it was coinciding with the Trump administration in the United States, but there is a growing agreement within the establishment of the United States, which goes beyond the bipartisan lines. That means whoever sits in January in Washington would have more or less the same policy, whether Democratic candidate or the Republican candidate. And that, of course, through the influences of the United States, would affect the rest of the Western Europe and Japan. Because Japan is the principal Western country in Asia, in a way. Of course, China will not sit and wait, but they will also seek to extend its own influence and its own protection zone. And then it comes again to the ASEAN, to Southeastern Asia, to Indonesia and to other countries of, uh, of, uh, of the region. Uh, that will come into a very difficult position to reject acclamation. I mean, as much as I know from the friends in Kemlu, uh, the foreign ministry, I know that Indonesia, and not only Indonesia, but other countries of Southeastern Asia would reject such an acclamation, would reject to say, okay, I'm for you and I'm against that one. But it will be in, in, in increasingly hard not to commit yourself to a position or to balance in the position. And that puts us back to the times when there was a larger project, which has been also initiated by Indonesia, and this is non-aligned movement. And recently I was just writing one article, which was uh, published by uh, Jakarta Post, so you can find it in English language. I don't know if someone translated in Indonesia in Bahasa, but so far it has been uh, repo republished uh, by uh, New Straight Times in Singapore, uh, in Cambodia, in uh, I think in in uh, Thailand and in uh, in the Philippines. So, and this is a short policy paper, which goes in line with what I was telling and talking about for more than ten years, and that is that Asia is still short of the comprehensive pan-continental organization. So Asia is the only continent that does not have 
a comprehensive organization to address all the needs and all the troubles, including the security ones. So Europe has <clears throat> Europe has Council of Europe and OSCE. Very often people who are outside of Europe, they are telling, aha, Europe, that means European Union. European Union is important, but not the most important organization. It's not even the first or the second most important organization. The first most important multilateral mechanism in Europe is the so-called Council of Europe, which is truly pan-continental, which includes every country. EU is a club of 28, now 27 nations, and Europe is far larger. So it's Council of Europe, and then secondly, it's OSCE, which means, or which stands for Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which even includes Canada and United States and the Central Asian states and the Caucasus states. So it's, it's even larger than Europe. So it's Europe and the surrounding. And it has a daily mechanisms on, mili on, on political military cooperation, on economic cooperation, on human dimension. So practically it's a forum to address any issue that triggers the stress among nations. Uh, American continent has organization of American states. African continent has African Union. When it comes to Asia, there are particular organizations that are existing. There is an Indian subcontinent. There is an organization which is called SARC. Then we have a CADA group, which was dealing with the nuclear issues of Far East. Then we have a Shanghai Cooperation Organization that practically bounds and connects China and Russia and Central Asians. Then we have GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, that includes Saudi Arabia and the smaller principalities of the western side of the uh, Arabian Peninsula in the Gulf, and so on and so forth. So practically, there are, there are several organizations, but none of them is truly pan-continental. And of course, ASEAN, which uh, gathers the, let's say, the, the, the continental, the mainland uh, uh, Indochina and the arch archipelago Southeastern Asia. And then all together combined actually represents, represents the, the, the gathering of so far 10 nations, 10 countries in, in the organization known as a, a ASEAN and headquartered in Jakarta. So practically, There is absence of any possibility to address issues of such an importance as security in the pan-continental sphere and to offer to the Asian countries a viable position in so-called third way, in which actually they will be able to maneuver out and to skillfully reject acclamation, be it coming from the United States or be it coming from, from China. Since the demise of, 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 of Soviet Union, Southeastern, China, Southeastern Asia has turned from the default lines, from the lines of two worlds, have turned into a very prosperous region in which practically the best of the both world has been combined. Not, of course, all countries of Southeastern Asia, of ASEAN, were under, in a way, American security umbrella. But Americans were the main security guarantor, the external security guarantor there. When it comes, especially when it comes to Singapore, to Malaysia, to, to the Philippines, to Thailand, in a way to Indonesia. So practically, this was nearly for free, a security guarantee, which was relaxing the stress posed on the domestic, let's say, military force. 
and was giving the articulation of military affairs in the region. So it was protecting dynamic, you know, that no party can be hostile. Or that the hostilities, if existing hostilities, that the hostilities are reduced to a minimum, that they don't represent larger threat. So there were frictions between the neighbors, between Thailand and, and, and uh, Cambodia. Uh, even between Malaysia and Indonesia, between Malaysia and uh, and uh, and the Philippines, or the portions, or the parts of uh, <clears throat> in in the northern uh, parts of Borneo, of Sabah and Sar Sarawak, and so on and so forth. So, so there were frictions, and they were all Vietnam and Cambodia, Laos and and Thailand, Thailand and Burma. So, name it you have, but those were rather an incident, a smaller frictions a border incident, but there was no larger conflict, there was no challenger. Why? Because, because actually the American security structure was around and no country was eager or willing or able or capable or daring to actually challenge something like that. On the other side, as the China was turning from the inward and backward society into a major manufacturer, Southeastern Asia, Asia started enjoying prosperity of relatively cheap and good or relatively stable quality of product, which were practically coming to a market and then retailers were able also to make their own margin. They've been importing practically those relatively cheap goods and then distributing all over Indonesia and other countries and making their own margin. So on one side, population was profiting because the goods were coming and the standard of living and the consumption and the purchasing power was going up. And on the other side, the trade was booming and the domestic retailers were also making the nice profit, nice margin. So everybody was happy. China was producing and was growing and was happy inside. Many people were employed. Uh, the trade was happy and the domestic consumers were happy. So everybody was practically happy due to Chinese manufacturing output. And on the other side, everybody, besides being happy, everybody was secure because the Americans who were controlling Pacific or Indo-Pacific, who were unchallenged power in this part, especially since the Soviets were, the, the Soviets had only the potential. Uh, the Soviets were the only power that have, that, that have had the military potential to challenge United States. So see, uh, since they have been eliminated from the scene, Americans were unquestioned. And we had decades of such a situation in which, of course, ASEAN was prosperous, in which ASEAN itself, including very much Indonesia as the largest country, was also prospering and was fastly developing. So Indonesia had also remarkable uh, economic growth for years, was seven, six, eight percent, so it was not double digit all the time, like in China, but was still impressive growth. I will just give you a comparison. We in Europe, we are happy when we have a growth of 0 0.25 or 0 0.5 or something, you know, so, so one uh, growth of, of, of one percent for us is a miracle already. You know? So six, seven percent is, is, is enormous growth. And this is the growth, actually. Uh, this is the growth that accumulates. So 6% <clears throat> of this year is not 6% of the next year because it's counted on already enlarged growth. So after 10 years, 6% represents far more than 6% 10 years before. So it's already accumulated wealth because you always count on the wealth that, that has been accumulated for the previous year. So in the first year is 10, and in the second year is already 12. 
and then it's six percent on 12 not on this 10 and after 10 years is 20 and it's six percent on 20 is far more than at the beginning so this is this is the notion so it was impressive growth and uh, uh, for students it's especially difficult to see because it's my young people but <clears throat> I remember when I started coming to Indonesia and if I compare that time and, and the time now uh, or the last time before Corona when I was there I was also visiting your school and giving a speech there uh, so it's 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 a tremendous difference actually it's clear it's clear difference that you can see so now unfortunately those times will be over and we will all have to undergo the painful uh, readjustment we will all have to readjust so in order to reject both sides you have to have practically your own narrative and the narrative that was existing is basically something that goes back, that trades back to 1956, when Indonesia, freshly liberated country from the occupier of Indonesia, from the oppressive colonial power that was <clears throat> committing unimaginable <clears throat> atrocities and practically a genocide in Indonesia and its people. So when this poor and backwards and, and, and wounded country was getting out, was not going into its own self-isolation, but was trying to give a worldview to help itself and also the similar nation and was calling upon a summit in Bandung, which was a strategic involvement of South-South Dialogue, Asia-Africa Conference, was a remarkable event, which we all have to be reminded of. So we have taken too many things for granted, and I'm sure when uh, most of you would know what was happening in Bandung, at least in few words. But we have to be reminded of the true essence and the meaning and also an impact of what it has created for afterwards. As I said, country was very poor, was devastated by the colonial power that was fighting bitterly for four years. So Indonesians, uh, 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 Dutch didn't want to leave the country. At the beginning of the Second World War, this is also very important to, to remember, uh, Dutch were bravely fighting uh, Nazi Germany for four days. And then practically there was no trouble so they've been <clears throat> living under German occupation some Dutch were cooperating with the Nazi regime most were actually not but practically they've been waiting a liberating force so someone else to liberate them and that was practically the Eastern Europe because the only two countries that were freeing themselves from the horrors of Nazis were Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. And they paid enormous price for it. And when practically Americans and the Britons have seen that Russians are undefendably advancing and they would actually turn to Germany and they would put Nazism to the end, then they started rushing and investing so much money and so much manpower actually to fetch up because they got frightened that the Soviets might come even to Paris. So they've been rushing. So technically, Netherlands has been liberated by Americans, but the main burden for all of it has been done primarily by Soviet Union and in a way by Yugoslavia. So technically, whose forces entered into, Indone into Netherlands 
were Americans. So nearly the first thing that the Dutch did when they've been liberated by someone else for four years, or actually nearly five years, they've been sitting still, doing nothing, not supporting Nazis, but also not actively fighting them. So nearly first thing that they did, they assembled Navy and they went and they wanted to recapture Indonesia. So they fought Nazis for four days and they bitterly slaughtered Indonesians very persistently for four years. This is also something, some chapter of history that should not be forgotten. How Dutch behaved before, during and right after the Second World War. Because Europeans love to give lectures, you know, to non-Europeans. So you can always politely remind them on how they themselves behaved. And then, of course, after all of it, you know, when they finally withdrew, they lived in denial. They have been not talking about crimes that have been committed there. So living decades and decades in denial, practically, and then treating all those war criminals, practically, the guys who committed a serious atrocities uh, against civilians, they've been treating them as heroes. You know, that's, that's, that, that was the situation. Anyway, so you can imagine how it looked like, you know. So, but still, there is a vision in the fathers of the Indonesian nations that they have to build a better world and that there is no separability between building the better country in Indonesia and archipelago and the world. That this is practically the same, uh, two parts of the same. And that was the notion, that was the philosophy. It's simple, but it's actually genial. And then the Bandung was coming, which directly inspired the first conference of non-light movement, which was coming shortly after in Belgrade of 1961, in which leaders of Indonesia, of India, of Yugoslavia, of Egypt and of Ghana and other countries were gathering and coming to the third way. The third way was the active and peaceful coexistence among nations. It was a hope and a shelter and inspiration for all nations that didn't want to become puppets of either United States or Soviet Union. Because if there is no third way, you have to sign up with either of, of those two. Or either of those two or both of them, like in the case of Horn of Africa and many other places in which they, sweep, uh, they, they swap sides, you will be used actually for the proxy wars of practically both powers. So the population would be devastated, the properties would be plundered and destroyed, while the big superpowers are playing their games of, of power and influence. So the third way was giving actually a hope, a shelter, an inspiration, a position. And then they, they created so-called G77 group in the United Nations, which was enormous voting bloc. You know, they, they've been outnumbering actually both combined superpowers and their satellites, their trabants. Because on either side, you had some 25 to 30 countries maximum. So that was the mobilization. So we were able to mobilize maybe 25, 30 countries and the United States, maybe a couple of more. But if even if you put them together, the group 77 was, was larger. In the meantime, group 77 was having over 100 votes. So it was an enormous block. So practically without non-line movement, nothing has been, has, been, has been achieved in the United Nations. So that means that for so long, for so many, non-light movement was giving a hope, a shelter and inspiration and was giving them a power far above 
their real size. So they've been getting far more than they in reality had. In the meantime, of course, the creation of ASEAN was coming, which is a closer proximity in a political, social, cultural, and all other spheres of the region. But in the situation of the strategic decoupling that is right now taking place between, in a way, today's superpowers, although we can't really compare and call them superpowers because China is still far more inferior in the military hardware, but on the other side has far more cash and practically is uh, entering into a financial, a financial system of the world uh, while the Soviet Union was uh, primarily mil military power, <clears throat> but were excluded from the financial, let's say, flows. So it was not integrated. So they were really two different, two different worlds. While the China represents the same world, like with the United States, it, it very closely participates in everything. Uh, buy state bonds of United States and so on and so forth, keeps the currency reserves. So it's in a way far closer and therefore uh, can intimidate uh, even deeper and hurt United States and vice versa. So they are closer uh, in many aspects, especially in the economic aspects. And in political aspects is, 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 is practically uh, the notion of the manufacturing in uh, China is also the, the capitalistic notion. So it's a, it's a way of, of performing uh, 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 of the capitalistic state. It's a nominally, in a way, it's a nominally socialistic or communist country, but in many uh, of its aspects, it's actually state conducted capitalism, nothing else. So they are far more, uh, let's say, proximities between those two which makes them very much uh, um, able to make vulnerabilities on the other. So switching from, 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 uh, from uh, trade, each other, of course, uh, creates big disturbances. So certain isolation or, or, or sanctions on the Soviet Union and its lager countries, we are not interfering anything in the world because they've been anyway excluded from the system. So putting the containment strategies stronger on Soviet Union in 70s or, or 80s did not in any way influence you know, financial or economic or trade, uh, let's say, uh, pathways in any way. So they've been anyway included. And on the other side, you know, the, the boycott of American goods or, or trade or whatever, nobody have met or have uh, felt, you know, in Moscow or in Warsaw because they've been anyway two different worlds, two different planets. So this today makes it therefore more vulnerable because there are very, uh, let's say, interconnectivities and, and proximities are far closer. So that will uh, uh, create actually this uh, strategic decoupling uh, to be very painful. And uh, therefore the, the proper adjustment has to exist and the proper answer to it. So practically archipelago of Indonesia, together with the rest of Southeastern Asian countries, which were economically and demographically booming. And if we compare ASEAN economies together, they're actually larger than India. And then of the mega economies, it would be most probably United States, China, and Japan, uh, very hardly to decide who is where or at which position, but let's say China number one, the United States number two, Japan number three. So they've been those, uh, let's say, leading three. And then number four would be ASEAN. And then number five would be India. Although India is far, far larger when it comes to demographics, you know, even then ASEAN combined, as you, as you know well. So practically, uh, there was already a booming position, but the geography also plays a role. 
It's the Strait of Malacca. It's very important portion that separates actually Indian Ocean, which is connection with the uh, Euro-African continent and supply and delivery lines, especially of energy. And then the, the continental uh, Indochina that separates, that divides Indian Ocean from the South and West China Sea and further on from Pacific. And Pacific, which is actually considered as the inner lake for United States, because the United States has to protect Pacific and the sea lanes between Gulf, by Indian Ocean, Strait of Malacca, South China Sea, further on to West and then to East Pacific up to its own West Coast. So it has to be, it has to be unjeopardized. It has to be a sovereign ruler of the sea. And everything below that actually represents the security threat. And for the Chinese, this is a suffocating position. They already have a grand plan. And this is intolerable, unbearable solution and situation. And they are trying to break through this, uh, to break uh, uh, through uh, and to break free from this, what they perceive as containment, as a blockage from their open access to the sea. So that means the default line will appear, especially over the Strait of Malacca, which of course influences directly a Sumatran and Javan portions of, of uh, Indonesia and the Malayan Peninsula. So it's absolutely without any say, it goes directly on the default line. And then both sides would be pressing very aggressively and very hard on actually acclamation of, of the countries of the region. So then the ASEAN, which is non-ideological body, will not be sufficient. And therefore, in my policy paper, I was suggesting that practically we have to revisit the chapters, the best of the chapters of non aligned movement, and that it has to be reloaded, revisited, re rethought and rethink. And then practically reinvigorated, rejuvenated, and then reloaded. As this is prob probably the best answer. And when I was talking about Nolan movement, in from the 60s, practically. <clears throat> this was a movement also that kept, which is absolutely underreported in literature, and it is obligation of us, elder generation, to inform you students to do research and to also revisit those chapters. A non light movement was directly responsible for tranquilizing relations in international, in the conduct of foreign, foreign policies, and in irresponsibilities of superpowers that we are seeking for confrontation as they've been contesting each other all over the planet. So the tranquilizer the smart, the brave, the visionary, the wise one was neither of the superpowers, neither Soviet Union nor United States. They've been egotistically promoting their own agendas on expenses of the planet. And who was the, who was the one caring about the stewardship of the planet was the non alive movement and Indonesia very much playing the role of it. So it's an enormous moral capital that exists in this. And this should not be forgotten, this enormous political and moral capital. And I'm very often telling this, you know, so when you're a young person, you know, you walk streets of Indonesia, it's not, you know, difficult to see a lot of troubles, you know, 
and to be critical, to say my society is not good because of this, because of that, you know. So this is a young voice, you know, so young people always <clears throat> critical, they see mistakes, they see uh, things to be fixed, which is good, you know, when you are young, you should be that, you know, and you have more adrenaline, more energy, more power, you know, you are receptive, and you want to change things, you know, you want to fight for your own space and place. And that's what, what brings, uh, uh, let's say, the young age. Uh, the elder age brings wisdom, you know. So, but one should not be forgotten that actually Indonesia is also having another picture. And this is a, a reputation, the picture that is seen from an outside. And especially for those who are very heavily criticizing the country, I would love that they witness the situation when, for example, Indonesian uh, delegate uh, speaks in the United Nations. So it's always with the respect and it's always with the admiration. Why? Admiration is not something you just get because you are beautiful and you buy a good uh, expensive shirt or batik, you know. This is earned. And how it is earned <clears throat> by decades and decades of doing things in a proper way. So that admiration, that accumulated capital, moral and political capital, has been actually achieved by promoting a very skillfully the third way, which has um, which has been embodied in a way also in the ASEAN grouping, but primarily and most of all in the non-aligned movement, which was, of course, Organization of Islamic Co uh, Cooperation, is the second largest multilateral mechanism after United Nations, by the number of membership and by the spread. Practically, it has with the Suriname, it has stretched on, on practically nearly all continents. So it's in Africa, it's in Asia, it's in Europe. And it's even in, 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 in the portion of the American continent. <clears throat> so this is the second largest mechanism <clears throat> because non-aligned movement uh, has no secretariat. But if you see the spread of membership and the number of members, non-aligned movement as a political movement is far larger, is by far larger and more influential. But now it's in a sleepy mode. Therefore, actually, this is the right moment to revisit those chapters of recent history. There is still living memory. There are people who are protagonists of all those summits and moves of the Nolan movement, which was going in some sort of uh, a, a temporary uh, retirement in the last few decades because after the collapse of Soviet Union that meant the collapse of the second world and then there was no second world which was contesting the first world you know the western world was contesting the, the, the communist world geopolitically and also ideologically so with the demise of that world there was no need actually for tranquilizing any confrontation because confrontation disappeared. And that meant actually that no life movement was going into some sort of retirement. But now it's time to take it back. And therefore my article was actually not only published in Jakarta Post, but also taken by several other countries of the region. It's published also in Europe, in the United States as well. but primarily in the region, because people understood in, in Jakarta, in Singapore, in Manila, what I, I was talking about. And what, what, let's say, difficult time is coming. Time is difficult, but time is also challenging. So therefore, uh, the young people should uh, also take this as an opportunity, because they are interesting times, and they uh, especially uh, students of law, uh, because there are a lot of uh, legal disputes on the sea in South, in South China Sea and elsewhere. There will be trade disputes, there will be litigations, 
So there are many opportunities in many fields of, of, of legal studies and science actually to give its own contribution. So there are challenging and interesting times that are ahead of us. In many countries, for example, in Europe, you know, when you study political science or economy or social science or law, there are no much excitement, you know, there is practically no big stuff to happen uh, for the young people. And in a way, it's boring because everything is settled. So for the Indonesian students and also from your university, as I know that you are your rankings, so your university rankings are among top in, uh, in Indonesia. So there are many opportunities, but one has to understand them and to be Ill, uh, diligent and intelligent, actually, consumer of information, not of misinformation. So instead of sitting and basically taking sides, who is for China, who is for the United States, the best actually serving Indonesian interests in the long run is the third way. But that third way cannot be, actually, I, I fear that no country, even of the size of Germany or France, will not be able to reject and to say, okay, so I don't want to be neither with you nor with you. I want to have equidistance. I have to, I want to have relationship with both of you. Of course, that, 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 that would be the wise conclusion, you know. When the little kid has been, is asked, you know, do you, do you love more your father or your mother? Then, of course, the child would always say, I, bo I, I love my parents both same way. So I would try to skip and to reject elegantly answering, you know, and telling I'm more for this and I'm less for that. Because it creates, of course, bad energy and, and bad, uh, uh, let's say, the negative dynamics. But for this in international, in the conduct of international affairs, is needed a little bit more. And it has to offer a narrative. And therefore I'm telling, I'm, 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 I'm pretty skeptical that even bigger countries like Germany, as I mentioned, would be able, or Brazil, really larger countries, larger economies, stronger powers, would be able to reject acclamation without having a very strong narrative and the narrative of the third way. So it has to, it has a perfect position, a geographic position, it has a need, it has a, a demand that comes, a geographic demand, and then it has its own institutional historical memory of what has been achieved in the past. So that actually puts Indonesia in a perfect position to revisit and rethink a non-life movement. We have the core, of course, of, of nations, which is India, Sam, and also then the larger, let's say, front, that, that is created through the, let's say, uh, reinvigorated and revisited uh, non-line movement, which of course would still represent a large uh, voting bloc in, in, in the United Nations and in all other forums that uh, of course can influence and, and uh, let's say, reverse the, the directions if directions are going into deviating course can diverse, uh, uh, divert them and can stop, let's say, uh, countries from the negative uh, influences. So that, that, uh, that would be, let's say, uh, very, uh, in, my, in my view, in my, in my mind, that would be very important uh, to do. Uh, since Asian continent is absent, since Asian continent uh, still does not have the pan-continental setting, there is still no a comprehensive organization for security and cooperation in Asia. 
and I've been telling, so there is my famous policy paper, which you can find in many languages, including Bahas. I think it's translated in over 20 languages and it's published practically. I, I even don't know any more account of 50, 60, 70 countries all over the, uh, the globe. It was even on a, on a page of the Prime Minister of Australia, you know, when she was uh, telling uh, uh, that was the policy of the previous uh, uh, Prime Minister of, of uh, Australia, Australia in Asian century. So in that chapter was my policy paper, you know, quoted. So practically it was a very simple argument. I said, okay, so everybody talks about Asian century and I'm telling you there is no Asian century without pan-Asian institution because the economic growth is not the only what matters. So the, those are brewing societies, they are mega demographies and with the economy and demography, actually the political and military aspirations are coming. And then, although we can't compare Europe with the Asia because Asia is far larger, the maneuvering space becomes tighter and tighter every day in Asia. And there is no forum to address those security needs. In Europe, we have it. We have a mechanism. If the Portugal suspects that, for example, Poland or Romania or Germany have suspectful military activity, we, ha we have such a you know, mechanism, you jump on plane and you go to that country even without any invitation or notification, you go and you inspect military facility. And that tranquilized tensions in Europe, therefore we have no war. Therefore the unification of Germany was possible. Before that, every unification of Germany meant war in Europe. We've been destroying and destructing ourselves and pulling other nations into such a war. So you saw, 89, Germany unified, but there was no war. Why? Because there was an OSC. Not because Germans were smart. No, all of us were smart, not Germans. So this something like that. So you see that actually this exponential growth of the continental might as China which comparably is, is Germany, you know, of, 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 of Asia, is harder and harder to, 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 to handle. And that exactly uh, uh, is a reminiscence of, of the post-Bismarck Germany, you know. China itself is overheated. China itself with the leadership does not know what to do with such a might, with such a strength, and is starting to contest its neighbors, it's starting bullying them, it's starting creating a problem to them. And also globally contesting. It has a global plan, it has a global agenda. A calculate, I mean, in very simple terms, a calculation of Americans in the 70s were very simple, you know. They understood it was the Brezhnev Soviet Union, you know. So they saw actually there is no way how to how they can destroy Soviet Union. And actually Americans were not destroying Soviet Union. Soviet Union des destroyed itself from an inside. That's another pair of shoes. So they've been desperate, you know, they, they, they said, okay, there is no political, economic or military means that we can destroy Soviet, you know. And they've been advancing and advancing, you know, in many fields, actually the economic performance or even of the East was far better than of the West in exploration of outer space, in acquiring the, of strategic weaponry like neutron bomb and so on and so on, so on and so forth, okay. So then the calculation was very simple. There was the administration of, of Richard Nixon, was Henry Kissinger there, and they said, okay, so we go to China and we will pull, pull the recognition from Kuomintang, China of Taiwan. We will pull it back to, to Beijing and by doing this, we will separate them as the Chinese will also come this country, you know. So we will separate them from the Soviet Union. This huge mega communist bloc, we will try to divide. We will play on their differences. A civilizational, linguistic, you know, 
a special historical attitude or a special historical position differences and many, many other differences between the two. So I said, we go to Beijing, we offer them recognition to split them. And then since they are so poor, we will identify Chinese coastal areas as its own suburbia. Because we in the West, we have trade unions, we have to pay this, we have to pay that. And now those ecologists are talking about ecological protection, you know, we have to put the filters and so many things, you know, the, the price of our production in our countries is becoming unbearable. It goes too much up. So let us identify Chinese coastal areas. Why Chinese coastal areas? Because there was no big infrastructure, a transportation infrastructure. So it's the best to put it on a coast and then to ship, you know, with the ships because uh, shipping is actually uh, using the sea lane is the cheapest mode of transportation. Right? And it's rather reliable. That was a very simple calculation. And then by involving them in the production, we would also involve them, you know, in spending and by spending and by production and by more money, they would shift from this idea of communism. So we will achieve we would separate China and Russia. So we will put a knife into a center of the communist bloc. We would manufacture cheap. And thirdly, we will, by doing all this and making huge profits for our private companies, we will be able to influence political processes in China. This was the calculation. So very simple calculation. No big philosophy in that. And it has failed right now. But in the meantime, China has overheated itself. And we doubt actually a comprehensive mechanism in Europe. So why we got the divorce in Europe? Because the center became too strong and started pressing on peripheries. That's exactly what is happening in, in, in Asia. China does not accept the position that they don't control even the, the sea next to their coast. It's unbearable and it's logical. On the other side, Americans want to keep in the Pacific. And they, do, and they, and they don't want to see anyone who would put them in question there. And this is actually a recipe for war. This is exactly the first world war between Britain and Germany comes when Germans started building the Navy. And then Britain said, okay, this is no way because if they are building a Navy, they will try to get overseas colonies and we will never give up colonies. If we give up the colonies, this is the beginning of the end. So how we will prevent this beginning of the end, we should destroy them before their Navy is capable to challenge us effectively on the seas. It's very simple. And then we ended up in, in a war. You know? So it's not that we in Europe, you know, sometimes I say, okay, I know Europeans love to, to, to give lessons, you know, lectures. They go to Asia, Africa, wherever, and they, they teach everyone. But in some aspects of history, you really have to listen to us. Not because we are smarter in Europe, but as a smaller continent, we walked faster through history. You know, you are a large continent. We did faster things. So we've been already there. The position that is right now in Asia, we've been already there 100 years ago. So that has been already happening. And therefore, you know, all, all those advices and, and my anxieties, because you clearly see that. But what was missing, you know, uh, 1914 and even 1941, was the nuclear weaponry. Now, I'm not sure that the powers would just accept to disappear without using so-called ultimate weapons. And unfortunately, we have in Asia a lot of, I actually, name it, you have it. You have, you have the legitimate, so-called legitimate nuclear powers, which is China, 
So that means practically that P5, the, 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 the five powers that are sitting in Security Council, they legitimize themselves. So they decided that they are legitimate. If you are P5, then, then you are a legitimate nuclear power. If you are not, then you are illegitimate. So they are declared and legitimate powers, which is China and Russia as a peripheral Asian power and United States is external, but it also has bases in nuclear warheads in Asia. Okay, then you have illegitimate but declared nuclear powers, which is India and Pakistan. Then you have North Korea, which even walked away from NPT, NPT. and then you have undeclared and illegitimate nuclear power, which is Israel. They never actually, they never confess that they have a nuclear bomb, but this is believed that they have between 200 and 240 low powered uh, uh, uranium, low powered nuclear warheads on convertible configurations all over the country, including the four submarines which actually then extends your strategic depth. And then you have at least two countries, if not even three, which are so-called turnkey technology countries, at least. And that is Japan, this is South Korea, and then it could be most probably Saudi Arabia, it could be Iran, and it could be Kazakhstan at least. So that means technically they don't have a bomb, but what they have, especially in the case of Japan and of, of, of Iran, they have capable delivery systems because once you have a bomb, you need a capable and very reliable delivery system because you know, imagine you know you put, you put a warhead, a nuclear warhead on a, on a, on a, on a rocket, and then your rocket is not reliable. So at the moment of launching, it, it explodes and practically you nuke yourself. So it has to be extremely credible delivery systems of rockets to put the warhead or to put three warheads on it. You have to be absolutely million times, million percent sure what you are launching. Otherwise you nuke yourself you know, at, the, at the launching moment because this is the most critical moment in the rocket science when you are launching the first, uh, what, 15, 20 seconds as the most critical period, okay? So besides that, you need a credible system. So credible delivery systems have Iran and Japan, especially Japan. And they have enough quantities of plutonium of the, of the, of the fuel to assemble bomb. It's a belief, uh, it is believed that practically Japan can assemble bomb within a week. Germans would need some months, but Japan's, uh, Japanese would need a few weeks. So they, they are the powers with the turnkey technology. So technically, do they have a bomb? No, but they have technology. So everything is there. It's like a housewife, you know? So there is no soup ready in a pot, okay? Sato is not ready, but you have all ingredients to make sato. Understand? So this is so-called turnkey technology. And they are, of course, those who are not having ingredients, so they can't make sato. Some are having a big sato, some are having smaller sato, and therefore they are very nervous about it. And some are just having all ingredients and the oven, everything is prepared so they can make sato very quickly, if needed. And some are absolutely beyond that. Some are so this 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 is a this is a composition of Asia. This this is what we have right now in Asia, and as I said, economically and demographically brewing countries. This is also the let's say nearly a law of geopolitics, is telling actually that practically that then you have a pro political design. If the society has economic and demographic, uh, uh, let's say expansion, they are growing they would of course seek for the political or, mili mili or political military articulation. They would need space and place. They would say, okay, so we have uh, 
we have the, the big ideas. We need more space. We need we mean we, we need uh, let's say influence, and then it of course uh, uh, means the the confronting uh, ideas and the views of the of the partners around. So therefore, the, practically Asia is a larger continent, but the maneuvering space between those mega countries and mega economies and and mega demographies is becoming tighter and tighter. And in the absence of of actually a comprehensive mechanism in which uh, we can address any need any time. As I said, we in Europe, we have this system. So we have the position that the Portuguese delegation, the military po Portuguese delegation sits on plane and appears in one, two hours, you know, in the, any site, military site in Germany, and they inspect. So even for the fact that you know that you have this possibility is tranquilizing tensions. And in Asia, you know, you can't expect, you, you don't know what your neighbors are up, uh, 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 up to, you know, and that creates tensions. They are border disputes, uh, they, are, they are actually unrecognized international border lines. And on the top of all of it, now comes the strategic realignment. And the region has forgotten actually how to play the active uh, peaceful coexistence among the nations and, to, and, and even the culture of Asia. You know, in many aspects, the political culture in Asia is more in the direction of basically uh, bandwagoning than on the on the multilateralism, multi-vector foreign policy. And those are the ingredients, actually, to uh, that are making every, uh, let's say, open-hearted and constructive analytical actually worrying. And therefore, actually, uh, please disregard notions and the, new, uh, the newspapers, articles, and the ideas which are not serving, actually, your position and your interest. Many aspects of this decoupling are not interests of Indonesia or Southeastern Asia. And you don't need to obsess yourself with them. But you have to actively seek, actually, for the narrative which will offer the third way. So I think I stop now because I see the time is running out, and uh, maybe we can we can exchange uh, a few more words uh, through the dialogue. I hope that uh, people have some uh, some some comments or questions, uh, or maybe some some portions I, I have to clarify further. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Anis, for your uh, remarkable lecture. Uh, dear students, if you have uh, any questions, please uh, raise your hand or you can talk directly to uh, Professor Anis. Okay. Uh, Zara, you want to talk directly to Professor Anis? Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, Prof. Anis. It is such an honor I, for me to talk to you. Derek. Can you uh, could you speak up a bit? I don't I don't hear you very well. Okay. Do you listen to me, sir? Yes. Um, so I have a few questions about the decoupling between the China and USA. And as we know that the economic independence between US and China is expected to prevent political conflict, but in fact, it would make the world economy fall apart. So my questions are the first one, does the economic decoupling between USA and China will also affect the economic relationship between Indonesia and the two countries, especially in the aspect of exporting and importing goods? And the second one is, does this mean that Indonesia must be on behalf of one of these two countries? Since Indonesia has a good diplomatic relationship between these two countries, there is no way Indonesia must take sides. Um, you can also write uh, read my questions on the chat if you want to. Thank you. Mm, I don't. I don't see them. Yeah, I but, already. The question. Uh huh. Uh, okay. Thanks. So practically. Of course, it will influence, so, so we don't know, you know, so it's, it's, it's a matter of economists to calculate and uh, uh, all aspects we can't, we can't predict. 
but as I said uh, earlier, uh, there is uh, there is no uh, or there is no much of the change of American uh, new uh, American shift in in this Sino-American relationships uh, relationship um, irrespectively for uh, uh, from the fact who sits in White House in January. So whether we have the same or the new president, uh, also the, the same goes with the Beijing. There is a, there is a clear line that um, the situation is unbearable and that practically the policy of engagement of United States have failed and that it's not serving the purpose. So practically that from the strategic rival, China becomes actually a foe, uh, an enemy. An enemy has to be combat uh, uh, in all possible means, including military means. And of course, as Indonesia occupies uh, uh, strategically very, uh, let's say, sensitive position, Indonesia will be clearly a target of influences of both countries. So there is no position and there is no possibility for China to break free from isolation. This is how they perceive. So uh, very often you have to take into consideration, you know, if you have to understand the moves of the country, you don't look from your own perspective, which might be very objective. You have to put yourself into a shoes of that particular player. If you have to understand your girlfriend, you don't think from yourself, you try to imagine her own position or his position of your friend, and then you are trying to seek the answer, why they behave this way, why they have told this, why they reacted that way or this way. So if you want to analyze, if you want to be sincere, and the same goes with the conduct of countries. So we have to put ourselves into a Chinese perspective. China believes it's a big power, it enjoys and it gets respect from all over the place, but they don't control even the sea next to that coast, their coast. They can't control, they can't exercise. And of course, there is a grab because it's an absolute commercial, military, a geopolitical, geoeconomic, you know, way. If you are able to extend by the sea, uh, by, the, by the law of the sea, if you can extend your economic, uh, uh, exclusive economic zone for 200 kilometers, or you have a credible, based on geomorphological credible evidences, claim that there is an extension of continental shelf. The mountain that goes down uh, under the surface of water continues, and therefore on that, on that pretext, you can extend your, your zone for another 150 nautical miles. So altogether, this is impressive, 350 nautical miles, which in kilometers is nearly double. So that means you can extend your own zone in the sea up to 700 kilometers. And this is, of course, tempting for every country. And then creation of artificial islands and so on and so forth. So practically, China is trying actually to flex its muscles in South China Sea and in East China Sea, which are anyway crowded geopolitically and geoeconomically crowded and they are contesting nations or the inferior nations that are getting very very nervous about it. in comparison with china everybody is smaller maybe india is not so of course that it triggers very nervous uh, attitudes you know in japan in 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 taiwan in in the philippines in indonesia malaysia i mean in all countries so it creates tensions. It, it, then then the, the, the entire you know, dynamic becomes negative. And then the Americans who are calibrating, this is, I mean, it goes without saying, Americans have the power in decline. So they are calibrating actually their imperial retreat by trying actually to minimize the costs. But their strategic line of protection is to be unquestioned on the sea that connects actually the Arabian Peninsula and the west coast of United States. 
They want to be supreme on the sea. And that creates clashes, and those clashes, those default lines are passing the Indonesian archipelago. You are not, your geography is not the uh, uh, geography of Chile. In Chile or in Argentina, I can say, okay, so maybe the third way, you know, by, by actually rejecting to, to, to come to either side would work. You say, I would cooperate with both of you. But in the position of Indonesia, I fear if the escalation goes on, you will have to explicitly declare yourself that neither of them would be satisfied by the answer, I will remain neutral. Neutrality will be not accepted. When we had a war in, in Europe, you know, the only one country was neutral, essentially, you know, was Switzerland. Why? Because everybody was trading through Switzerland. But the rest was not able to remain neutral. You know, you don't need to be a big genius to say, I'm, I'm neutral. You know? But neutrality was not affordable, was out of the, of the, of the, of, of, of question, you know. You have to side up with, with this. You are either with me or you are against me. There is no third way. So I will bleed, I will fight, and you will be neutral. You will pick up the fruits from all. You will take best of the both. It's impossible. You have to be with me or against me. So either you are my friend or my enemy. And I, unfortunately, I see that actually the escalation will go into this so-called binary categorization. And the just simple rejection of siding up will not be enough, that we need more than that. And this is a narrative. And with the narrative, it would be far easier. And of course, it would influence Indonesia. It would slow down. But there is indigenous, there are a lot of indigenous reasons why Indonesia is growing. Of course, the impact would be there. But still, if Indonesia is, careful, uh, is skillfully doing the narrative and, and actually supporting itself through the block of the like-minded nations, they would actually amortize and minimize the impact and would have, because it's a huge country, it's a huge demography, it's a huge territory. So the, the, the indigenous growth, the growth that is induced from an inside, your growth is not related to China. In a way, it is. Pa portions of it are related to it. Portions of it are related also for the fact that Indonesia is also together with Malaysia, in a way, Singapore is actually controlling the Straits of Malacca. But let's say most, I mean, if you want in percentages, 80% of your growth is actually indigenous growth. It comes from an inside. So 10, 15% is related to this trade, the cheap trades, and then actually security relaxation that was existing up to now. And, uh, and uh, uh, actually, but, but the rest is coming, is coming as, as, a, as an indigenous one. So in, in, in Closing uh, uh, my answer to your question, it is very important. I know it's uh, it, uh, uh, legal studies, you know, law faculty is not really the best one. Maybe it's, uh, it's more FISIP and, and uh, economy. But I would invite both students and my fellow colleague professors, including Dean, uh, to give assignments to students in this problem. You know? So you don't need to, to deal with the trade disputes between Britain and Netherlands, you know, or, or France and Belgium. Uh, as, as professors often, you know, give to students academic for, for the purpose of academic drill. You have to make an exercise, uh, you have to make uh, uh, examination or some assignment and we give you some uh, abstract, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, homeworks to do. So I'm, I'm, I'm really appealing on, on, on both. Actually do your works and, and exams and, and, and uh, case solving in this direction, which would, which would uh, address realities that are actually inevitably coming. So that's it. Thank you, Prof, for the answer. Okay, is there any more question? Actually, Professor, uh, the students also asking through the chat section, would you yes. uh, mind me to read the question? Yes, please, please. 
Or you will write it, uh, read it by yourself? Okay, so... No, I don't, I, like don't, I, don't, I don't see uh, it here are, on the screen. Okay. Okay, I will read it for you, Professor. Uh, we already know that each Sino or America uh, has their own trade system strategic. One of uh, example is it have a trade diversion that every stuff from America to Sino or from Sino to America will more expensive than the hardest is uh, boycott. So that two countries will choose another country to having some trade cooperation. And Indonesia is one of best country to do that due to good strategic geography. So what is the best thing uh, to do by uh, Indonesia, the government of Indonesia? Because we know that Indonesia has free and active foreign policy. And is there an impact for the trade relation between Indonesia with one of the two country if Indonesia having a trade cooperation with one of them? Thank you, Professor. That is the question. Okay. So I was just I was just sending you uh, uh, an email that uh, everybody who is interested in topic and who wants even to write a thesis or whatever I'm very very open to co coach because uh, uh, as I'm not a regular professor at your school I'm not entitled to be a coach for the thesis but of course I can be a co coach or or let's say. Uh, can help and I'm always happy to engage in especially things which are very constructive and which are addressing reality. So I just send email. So for all faculty members or students, uh, uh, feel free to, to answer, to, to, to contact. And also, if you are writing uh, articles on that topic, I must say at this point, actually, that uh, uh, me, who is European, you know, of course, I mean, I grew up in Yugoslavia, which was having an excellent relations with Indonesia. We've been the brotherly nations, you know, so it's, it's let's say, in my personal history, then out of my own interests and passions, you know, I started coming to Asia and Southeastern Asia and Indonesia for many years, you know. I've been practically in Indonesia cumulatively nearly two years. I don't know how much time I have spent there, you know, teaching it so many schools but irrespectively from that you know the point is you know i would like to read more voices from indonesia and from ASEAN countries on this this is also very important so so in in a nutshell you know why should me from europe write about this you know so why should i be concerned so people oh, and why it is so because you know there is so much of the narrative which is not your indigenous narrative in media that people practically by reading, you know, they always divert it to, 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 to carry and to take into consideration some, some issues which are not, you know, directly indigenously important uh, and, and, and they are considering them. So those are the uh, understanding the, the moment and the place is the most important, is the most important of all. And in that regard, again, you know, so geography plays the role and, uh, and also the skillful and the constant, actually, research, thinking, mediation, uh, even uh, creation of events. You know, so one of the events that you can do at school, maybe together with FISIP or the Faculty of Economics, is exactly this topic. You know? So, uh, and, and to engage also young people. I'm always, I'm always very, very, let's say, keen on engaging young people because after all, we live in the society with a generational contract. So everything that the elder generation does is actually to the benefit of the, of the, of the following generation. And also young people are having fresh ideas. Young people are not conventionally thinking and the elder people actually are more experienced they have uh, wisdom. So energy and the wisdom in combination is excellent. If you have just energy, this is a lot of water without the, the let's say, the river banks. Or on the other side, we have a perfect river banks, you know, which is a wisdom, but we don't have water that, that flows inside. So both of them create a good river, the, the good vibrant river that gives us a life. So in this combination, actually younger, and the other generation, we get 
we get the best best answers. And as I said, so I would be very eagerly also helping you to make a conference on this topic, you know, to invite other speakers and actually to fight for agenda, to promote this, this narrative. You know, firstly to make the substance of all this narrative and then to create and to be more, uh, let's say, extensively uh, 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 taking this narrative into consideration. And not only that this will this would help Indonesia and the ASEAN and the archipelago and Southeastern Asia, it would also help those two new superpowers that are going into confrontation. Because in 70s, 80s and 60s, non-light movement made also those two superpowers constrained made them very often to go home and to think and to become milder, to become more human and more at service of the main kind. And unfortunately, the collision course and the collision logics that you enter, you know, it's self-perpetuating. It's, like it's like a married couple which starts fighting and which knows that divorce will come. And this negative logic goes and goes and goes. There is nothing that goes into the direction of reconciliation. Everything goes further on escalation <clears throat> without this third voice. So it's not only that the narrative of the third way, the active narrative of the third way would help its own protagonists. It would help also those two fighting and confronting powers that are entering into a logic. <clears throat> when you see in the rhetorics how they how they address each other, you know, Americans are uh, 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 a current American president says China virus, and the Chinese say no, Americans military brought the pathogen. You know, those are serious accusations, and we can't we can't live prosperously in the world with such an accusation. <clears throat> And they they say this is a country of Kong of uh, of uh, of uh, Kong flu, what's called Kong flu, nego Kong flu, and so on and so forth. And 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 then and then the the state uh, Mike Pompeo, uh, state secretary of the United States, proclaimed as a public enemy number one by Chinese. So with this rhetorics, you know, you don't go into a betterment. And then the let's say the passive way of telling, okay, I'm neither for you, I'm neither for, for, the, for him, you know, I want a little bit with you, a little bit with him, is not enough. It does not serve the actual moment on the, on the planet. So you can find the, you can find the article in, in Jakarta Post that has been published. It's not a long one, but it actually explains what I was trying to share with you today in the lecture. And of course, there are lot of other things that I was writing in this direction, including these policy papers, you know, nearly 12 years, 12 years ago, you know, I was telling no Asian century. This has to be, this has to be done. And I remember coming all over the place and they're, uh, they're asking me about the Brexit, about this and about that, you know, and I was telling, okay, yes, guys, but I don't understand why, why does it matter for you? You have to, I mean, if I come here, you have to share with, with me your own narratives. You don't need to carry, you know, about the problems of elsewhere, more than about your own one. But why? Because media is so obsessed, you know. So practically, we've been terrorized all over the globe with Brexit. Brexit was relevant eventually for EU, even not that much for EU as much as, as we gave the, the, the cover. But many other portions of the world were actually uh, 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 taking care too much of this and not of their own other uh, problems, which are far higher on the agenda. Yes, maybe, 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 maybe one, two more uh, of the comments. I, I saw now. I see now comments. So, or or question if we have. Okay, is there uh, any more question from the students uh, for Professor Anis?
Well, I think there is no more question, Professor. Okay. 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 If there is no more more question, you can uh, give the closing statement for the students. Okay. So I'll I, I, I'll just uh, share the link. I found the link now while we've been talking. So that's that's from the Straight Times of the uh, oh, okay. a few days ago. So they can share. So there is there is my uh, contact, and there is a uh, uh, there is a link with the article that has been uh, uh, published in Jakarta Post. So as okay. the as the closing okay. one, uh, uh, thank you very much for entrusting me with this call. Uh, sorry that we didn't talk yesterday, uh, because we had we had unfortunate event here in Vienna. Uh, which of course is is maybe for some other yeah. uh, opportunity to talk, uh, because unfortunately it was again um, uh, allegedly a case of the Islamic terrorism, uh, in which actually uh, gives to a lot of thinking to the Muslim world uh, why they are perceived as a part of a problem on this planet and not part of a solution. Uh, and uh, and to the Western uh, European societies, it gives also a lot of uh, issues to think why people are not integrated and why people who grew up, practically they are born and they grew up in the society, they don't feel that society is their own. Because this boy, unfortunately, who got killed later and who uh, uh, was killing other innocent young people on the streets of uh, city of Vienna, of Austria, was uh, actually ranged by, by the anger and was seeing in those young people who been shooting uh, enemies, you know, because he felt, and actually uh, they've been of the same age uh, uh, and grew, uh, they grew up in the same country, but he felt that he's not belonging to them. So, so for both sides, actually, this tragic event gives a lot to think. Uh, so as I said, to the Muslim world of nearly 2 billion people, uh, uh, gives a lot of to think why the rest of the globe sees Muslims as part of the problem of this planet and not as a part of a solution. And to Western Europe, it gives, it gives a lot of to think why they are unable to integrate people and why they've been, be, they've been destabilizing a lot of countries of the Middle East and creating the desperate moves of people who are, of course, exponentially coming and they can't be integrated into Western societies. Although most of those activities of the terrorist activities in Europe, in France, in Germany, in Netherlands, Denmark, Spain, Britain, in former uh, times, they've been committed by so-called second generation, not by the newly arriving immigrants, but by the second or the third generation immigrants, mostly of the Muslim origin. So that gives that gives a lot of lot of thinking. And therefore, actually, we did have a lecture yesterday because it was a shock. Uh, in Vienna, Austria, there was no terrorism for practically for forty years. We had some Palestinian. Uh, Palestinians uh, were actually uh, doing some terrorist activities, but it was uh, practically not any longer in a living memory of anyone in Austria. So it was, it was a shock. It was the center of the city and it was the evening, it was a very mild weather in Vienna. It was the um, evening before the lockdown, the second lockdown, a lot of youngsters were going out and the shooting was taking place actually where the very young people go out. It's so-called Bermuda Dreik. It's like a triangle with a lot of cafes. And that, that sends shockwaves, you know. So, so practically the whole country has been in shock and, and uh, nothing uh, was, was happening yesterday. Uh, I have never seen the city so calm. Practically nobody was going out and the national mourning was coming. It was a, a big, big shock. It was a very sad day. Uh, so, therefore, lecture was taking today place. Uh, I'm very thankful for, for your invitation. 
I still have a fresh memories of your university, of your charming uh, dean, uh, of professors, uh, and uh, I hope I will be able to come again physically and to meet because it's not the same, you know, to do it via Zoom and to to meet in person. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, we have to we have to work and we have to go, and especially it goes for the young people. Do not. Do not waste your days. Do not sit in pyjama. Uh, uh, lockdowns, unfortunately, still to be in place. Uh, try to do every single day something for yourself. And that very much includes physical activity. Be careful on your nutrition and be very cautious on... on uh, I know it's absolutely unrelated to decoupling uh, between the two powers, but... Uh, since I love Indonesia and its people, uh, that's also important because only healthy mind and healthy body can bring healthy politics. You know, so if you are sick and ill, you can't you can't build good things. So especially for students, uh, do physical exercises. Uh, be careful on the nutrition. I know that people love uh, spicy food, uh, not too much because it's not good for skin, and it's not also good for for liver. So uh, be, 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 be responsible on, on your body, but also, uh, although Zoom gives you the, the privilege that you don't need to dress up and to go out, you sit at home or you, in your dorm, you know, do every day something for yourself because the young generation, once the, the, the crisis is over, you know, the, every crisis, especially this crisis is like a letter U. We go deep inside, or letter V. So we go deep inside, but we will go very fastly up. So you have, as a young people, you have to understand this as an opportunity. You have to exercise a lot, mentally and physically, and to be ready when we go up. Otherwise, if you are going into atrophy and sit with the Netflix and the movies, you know, with the Korean soap operas, uh, and and and, and uh, serials, you know, you will not realize that the world goes up, and we will miss your you will miss your opportunity. Therefore, it's very important that every day you do things for yourself, mentally and also physically. Physical activity in the times of the lockdowns, as much as it does not violate the regulations, the local regulations, is absolutely necessary. So if you can't go out you can make uh, any physical exercises at home. So this is very, very important. So that would be my, my, my closing statement. Because unfortunately, in this crisis, we talk about illness, we talk about virus, we don't talk about health, what to do to prevent to become ill. We talk about yeah, so many people are infected, but we don't talk how to achieve and maintain health. We need to be healthy. We need to promote society of health, not illness. Okay. Thank you, Professor, for a very insightful lecture for uh, today. Thank you. So uh, on behalf of our Dean, Professor Ratna Saraswati, I would like to say thank you. And I wish that you can come back here in Indonesia in the next better time, maybe. Uh, and then I hope that you are all in good condition uh, in Austri Austria. Uh, I will end the session here. Thank you. Terima kasih, Professor Anis. Thank you. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.